so uh, because we can build a coordinate on this on, on the surface sigma and we can even adapt the lattice on this coordinate so definitely we can define a coordinate lens yeah this is it, of course the coordinate lens you cannot coordinate but once we have a coordinate we can we can compute the lens of the of all the edges and also the area of the surface because once we have we know what is the lens coordinate lens. of course this will depend on coordinate but we can have those parameters mu and uh, mu square and then the uh, continuum limit of the lattice if you refine if you infinitely refine the lattice and then the coordinate length uh, of the edge will will shrink right and suppose it is uh, mu but suppose you refine the lattice by putting a vertex in the middle and the mu will become half of mu right? and furthermore the, the coordinate length will go smaller and smaller and so if you have a refined lattice and this mu is very small okay? this mu uh, parameter will be very small Okay, so then uh, well, let's say this coordinate in x coordinate. Let's say this coordinate is x because we always use x. Okay, and um, you can consider the continuum and um, the continuum limit of the flux var variable t. Okay. Um, okay. And here uh, it may be useful to write formula for smaller p, the, the lowercase p, it equals to in the limit as mu goes to zero, the continuum limit. Limit p equals to this theta a square. Square two times mu square and e a j at source of e and plus order q mu to the three. Okay, so you can see that um, if you take the continuum limit, this lattice variable p just recover the uh, continuum field. And uh, similarly, uh, if you take the lattice continuum limit, the holonomy, it's also easy to see that holonomy is just exponential connection. Uh, holonomy is just the exponential connection. If you take the continuum limit, this holonomy just recovers connection. So this is even simpler. Okay, so this is the uh, second property, and this is your homework to, to prove them. Um, ah, sorry. So this is the third property. So this is another property. Three, another simple property. So pj um, e inverse. Suppose you have an edge, and if you re reverse the direction of this edge, reverse the, the, the orientation of the edge, and this uh, flux also changes. Okay. You can see that this uh, flux equals to and relates to the original flux by certain transformation. Actually by a certain rotation. If you view flux is a vector. E and P by P it is it is a uh, useful property for uh, gauge covariant flux. Okay. So this is coming from reversing the orientation of edge. Okay, and this is your homework to prove one, two, and three. So all of them are are very simple properties, and you just plug in formula. And Okay, so now we have uh, finished our de definition for the lattice variable. Um, now, let me make a summarize. So uh, at the beginning, we have the smooth field. Smooth field. Um, A and E. 
A is the XR connection, and B is sensitized the plus, sensitized the twice. And for those variables, we have a smooth SP2 gauge transformation. Smooth gauge transformation. So here, we, uh, at this moment, we only consider this uh, SP2 gauge transformation. The DP morphisms uh, we consider later. Transformation. So G of X belongs to SP2, or it's uh, for any X. Of sigma, or g of x is the uh, su2 value of function. Okay, and then uh, on the lattice, we have a lattice field after discretization. We have lattice field. Um, so a and e changes. We use uh, holonomy and gauge covariant flux. Okay. Uh, well, um, these those variables you can see that uh, it forms a space. All those um, values uh, values of lattice fields forms a space. Uh, more space. So this belongs to. So firstly, holonomy belongs to SU2. Yeah. And flux belongs to R3, it's a vector. Yeah. And uh, to the power uh, number of edges. So here it means, uh, the, the, well here it's like absolute value of a set. So this E of gamma is the set of all edges. And if you take um, absolute value, kind of absolute value, uh, of this set, it means the number of elements. So, this, so here we open use this notation. Uh, e gamma absolute value it is the total number of edges. Uh, and similarly, if we have these is a number of vertices. So here on, on one edge you have a holonomy and you also have a flux. It means you have a uh, on one on, on one edge your uh, uh, space of lattice field is just SU2 cross R3. But you have uh, many copies of edges then you need to have a power e to the gamma. Uh, so here, this uh, SU2 cross R3, it is usually written as, uh, as this. So SU2 cross R3, it is usually written as a so-called cotangent bundle of SU2. If it's T star SU2, it means uh, it's called cotangent bundle uh, of SU2. Well, if you know something about fiber bundle, so this is just one kind of uh, fiber bundle. Um, uh, well, it's a fiber bundle for the for the co-vectors for the dual vector. It's a it's a fiber bundle for the dual vector. Um, yeah, and, and usually a cotangent bundle is a phase space. Uh, it relates to a cotangent bundle relates to a phase space. And, and here, this SU two cross R three. This is just uh, isomorphic to the cotangent bundle. Of SU2 because well, for SU2 uh, the cotangent bundle is trivial. It's a co it's a globally trivial bundle, so it is just uh, R2 cross R3. Okay. So, uh, so in the following, sometimes I will just write the phase space on the lattice. For the, the the space of the lattice field is a cotangent bundle of SU2. But what I mean is just uh, SU2 cross R3. Um, all right, and now the, the gauge transformation is also discretized. So you also have the lattice gauge transformation. It is uh, it's not a smooth field anymore, but uh, only gauge transformation on the vertices. Which belongs to V gamma. V belongs to V gamma. Okay, and then these uh, gauge transformations, because each gauge transformation belongs to 
uh, SU2 at each vertex, the gauge transformation belongs to SU2, then the entire gauge transformation is uh, SU2 to the power V gamma. V gamma is the number of uh, vertices. Okay. Um, so this is our, and this summarize of all our um, procedure for the discret discretization. And one of the key points I should emphasize is that, um, uh, so this discretization is background independent. So this is the background independent discretization. Independent discretization. So the reason is that all our discretization doesn't depend on metric. It's coordinate independent and, and all our uh, discretization doesn't really assume that there is a metric yeah, because you see the formula for the covariant flux, it has no metric. Yeah. It doesn't really depend, doesn't really assume there is a metric on the space. And similarly, holonomy, it is the integration of the one form along the curve, then it doesn't depend on the metric. So all this discretization doesn't assume that uh, there is a metric. So it is, it has to be like that for uh, for gravity because we are doing gravitational field. Gravitational field is background independent because gravitational field is background. Is uh, the, the, the gravitational field is uh, the dynamics of gravitational field determine the space time geometry. Uh, so so uh, so to study to study uh, or to quantize gravitational field, we shouldn't assume any background metric. So all our procedure, all our uh, procedure must must be uh, background independent. Okay. Um, next, what we should study is so-called uh, holonomy flux algebra. Flux algebra. This is a. Um, it is nothing but the uh, Poisson algebra uh, between those lattice variables. Because uh, for A and E, for smooth field, we have a Poisson bracket, we have synthetic structure, uh, Poisson bracket. Uh, we should compute the Poisson bracket between those lattice variables. So this is the Poisson algebra, Poisson bracket. H and T. Okay. So um, for those Poisson brackets, because when we if we want to quantize those lattice variables, so in the end uh, those lattice fields will become operators acting on a certain Hilbert space, and then we should know the Poisson bracket to um, replace Poisson brackets to commutate, right? and the quantization will replace Poisson brackets to commutate. Then firstly we should understand the Poisson bracket. Okay, so here again, theorem. So this is the result. So firstly, holonomy and holonomy for two well for arbitrary edges and e and e prime can be the same or different, but the Poisson bracket is always zero because both h so h only depend on uh, connection a. Yeah. So both of them are functions of a. Then Poisson bracket must be zero. A uh, Poisson bracket with A is zero, and here we got non-trivial Poisson bracket between P and A okay, because P depends on E and H depends on A equals to kappa gravitational constant, and then here is the delta E prime. So it means that suppose these two E's are are different, you just get zero. So so P E integrates on a dual surface. But suppose this dual surface has no intersection with, uh, with E prime, then it just gets zero. Uh, you get non-zero only when this dual phase, dual phase of E is really dual to uh, uh, the edge where this holonomy is defined. Yeah. Then suppose this non-zero, what the result is tau j half uh, multiply h of E. Uh, well, more probably more precisely, um, um, is I should put indices for the matrix element because these are the matrix 
So what I actually mean here is that for any matrix element, H A B H C D so here A B C D equals to one or two because uh, H is two by two matrices. Uh, so for any matrix element, the quotient bracket is zero. So so given the matrix element, it is a function. It's a function of A. It's a it's a phase function uh, on phase space. The matrix element is a number, and it depends on depends on A. Uh, so it's a function. On the phase space. And similar here, so here I should take H, A, B, the matrix element, um, and it's a function on phase space, and you compute total bracket, and the result is also the matrix element here. Uh, so, but usually in the li in literature, people just uh, ignore this A, B index, just write uh, matrix. Okay. And here for P, quotient bracket with P, you still get non-trivial result uh, because P also depend on A. P uh, depend on both A and E. So the result is non-trivial. You get minus kappa. So e prime. So here you get zero if E not equals to E prime. So here you get a delta. And also you get epsilon J Okay, so um, the first formula I will call one, two, and three. Okay, uh, all right, so these are the results. So, so you can see that the quotient bracket are very simple, the results, the results are all very simple. Um, so, give you some remarks. These are very important results. They are, they are key results in, in system graphics. So remarks. So firstly, um, well clearly they are derived derived uh, from from quotient bracket between A and E uh, of smooth field. Because um, holonomy and flux, they are just functions of A and E, and you compute the quotient bracket just like computing quotient bracket between functions of uh, uh, of quotient brackets of phase space functions. Um, secondly, uh, so here from this formula, uh, you can see that a, P and E, uh, P and H, they are kind of conjugate variables. H, P, J, they are kind of conjugate variables. And from the continuum limit, you can also understand them as conjugate variables because uh, the continuum limit of P give you E, while the continuum limit of holonomy give you back A. And third point is that uh, one of the interesting parts of uh, this holonomy flux algebra is that uh, for for uh, uh, relation number three, uh, it is real kind of analog with the angular momentum. So you can compare with the equation three with angular momentum. I say okay, come here, right? And in quantum mechanics, you have learned that a lot about uh, commutation relation of angular momentum. Okay. Okay. So um, um, we also know that uh, if you quantize a poson bracket, you just replace poson bracket by commutator in quantum mechanics. And so here you can see that the PP poson bracket equals to, suppose E equals to E prime, right? suppose these, these two edges coincide and it is non zero, then PP poson bracket is just epsilon, epsilon times P. Right? It's, it's very much the same as. Uh, the commutation relation of angular momentum. So here you can see, you can expect that the quantization of this uh, gate covariant flux P uh, is is just angular momentum operators. So this is from this quotient bracket, uh, you, you are going to make this expectation. Um, 
Okay, for proof, so let me prove them. Uh, well, I mean, this is end of the class, so which means I only <laughs> give you the proof of the first, and I will prove it. Uh, uh, I will give you the proof of the first formula, which is trivial. So this is one equation one. It's just a trivial, trivial from a a i f y equals to zero. Connection extra connection open bracket is zero. Both of them are uh, configuration variable. So therefore, and holonomy. Holonomy is a function of a only, then the bottom bracket is zero. Okay, so next time I will prove uh, three, uh, I will prove two. The three will be your homework, but uh, the homework next time. Yeah. So next time I'm going to calculate uh, equation number two. All right, so I think that's all for today. Yeah. Is there any question? Okay, so if there's no question, then uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.